Oh yeah. Uh. Hello my friends. It is time for the long awaited review of the Priority 600X. I'll make this short. It's awesome. And I'm not just saying that because I helped design it. It's truly a sweet bike. First off, I need to thank Priority Bicycles for inviting me to collaborate with them on this beauty. The 600X is the culmination of many months of designing while taking into account years of bikepacking experience to create this dream machine. Our goal was to build something bomb proof with top notch components while keeping the price reasonable. And we did it. There is nothing like this on the mass market. You can't go to any bike shop and buy something like the 600X. Here's a quick rundown of how this bike came to be. This March, Dave at Priority called to tell me that Eddie, one of his top guys, was designing a pinion bikepacking bike and asked if I wanted to give them some feedback. Um, yes, I'm a huge fan of the pinion gates drivetrain. I've been rocking the Priority 600 as my everyday commuter for over two years. And the idea of using this maintenance free technology on a bikepacking bike got me very excited. After going back and forth a bit on the design, we ordered a prototype. Yeah! And I told them that I'd like to test it out on the Great Divide mountain bike route. They thought that was a great idea. And in mid-July, I jumped on a shiny new 600X at the border of Canada and Montana. Oh, it's gonna be a beautiful day. For the next 1,800 miles, I had the time of my life. That route is incredible. If you haven't seen the series, I will link down to it below. I pedaled up and over big mountains, across deserts, through a few rainstorms, and the bike performed like a champ. I did zero maintenance for the entire 1,800 miles. None! You can even ask Mira to verify this, and she never lies. Yeah. Can I have a hug? Yeah, give me a hug, buddy. The 600% gear ratio was more than enough for riding up super steep mountains. And I could really hammer on the flats. I'll share an interview that I did with one of the employees from Pinion later on in this video. You'll learn everything you could ever want to know about Pinion technology. The TRP four piston brakes performed smoothly, especially on the infamous Fleecer Ridge which ranges from a 16 to 38% grade. Yeah. Oh my God. The Gates carbon drive handled all the elements. I've been using these carbon drives on a variety of bikes for four years and I've never had an issue. And here's a fun fact. Gates was founded in Denver in 1911 and these belts are made in Kentucky. Later on in this video, I chat with my friend Mark and he talks all about the ins and outs of these carbon reinforced belts. I will say though, that at times it got squeaky on the dusty roads in Montana. This slight annoyance was fixed with a few squirts of water from my water bottle to wash off the belt. But that's a small price to pay for something that lasts three times longer than a chain and never needs to be lubed. The aluminum frame felt snappy and light, and I know there's a lot of debate about steel versus aluminum, so I'm gonna have Eddie talk about why they chose aluminum for the 600X. You know, when we went about designing this bike, we wanted a bike that was really gonna perform well loaded, so frame stiffness does come into play with a bike with a lot of weight on it. So aluminum is stiffer than steel, for instance. So we didn't want the bike to feel too whippy uh, when loaded down with a lot of gear. Um, and also aluminum is lighter. So we wanted this bike to perform well, uh, both loaded and unloaded. So aluminum is lighter and stiffer compared to a steel bike. Um, a lot of people think that steel will give you this great ride quality, but on a bike like this, that's got tires and suspension, that's gonna absorb most of the bumps for you. Now this may sound kind of inconsequential, but I love the grips. Sometimes it's the little things on a bike that make a big difference. They cup your hands nicely. It's kind of like getting a little hug for your hands. And these little nubbins on the side act like bar ends to rest your hands. 
The handlebars also have the right amount of back sweep for comfortable days of eight plus hours in the saddle. Now on to the tires. I really like the minimal tread on these WTB Rangers. They fly on pavement and have enough grip for going up and down loose dirt. I ran these tubeless and didn't get one flat tire on the entire trip. This prototype is great and it performed really well on the divide. But while I was out there, I was taking notes about ways to make it even better. And when I got back from the trip, Dave, Eddie, and I huddled up and I told them what I'd like to see for the final production model. They took into account my ideas, added in some of their own, and together we created a dream bike. Now let's talk about the changes we've made. First off, a sweet bike needs a sweet logo. I chose the gray frame color to keep the bike low key, but it needed a little something something. Get out there! This slogan is something that I've been using since my days at Public Access TV. Hello and welcome to Out There! My mission has always been to inspire my viewers to get off their couches, and it's an honor to have this logo on the 600X. And those mountains are the famous flat irons here in Boulder. Thank you, Connor at Priority, for helping to design this. The ability to carry stuff is essential to bikepacking adventures. And by stuff, I mean beans. So we decided to make the main triangle a little bit bigger in order to accommodate a larger frame bag. The exact dimensions are on the page for this bike. I will link that down below. Okay, the new model will also have way more mounting points. We want it to have plenty of places to mount bottle cages or gear cages and maybe even a rear rack. Eddie, tell us where they are. So we've got bottle cage mounts on the inside of the frame, uh, also on the bottom of the down tube, on the top of the top tube, and something that is totally new as far as I know, which is cage mounts on the seat stays as well. Yeah. So even if you fill the frame with a frame bag, you can still have bottle cages on the seat stays, on the bottom of the down tube. Uh, you could do a solid mount frame bag in, in the middle of the front triangle. We're gonna have some eyelets here as well. Um, so you can bolt all kinds of stuff to the bike, which is one of the really cool aspects of it. I'm really excited about this change. We've added clearance for up to 2.8 inch tires. I'm a fan of wide tires. You can roll over things more comfortably and it's great for sandy trails like the Baja Divide, one of my favorite places to suffer. I don't ever want to see sand again in my life. Also, we're going to have a tougher tire compound than the light version I had on the Divide. I wore through those tires pretty quickly and the tough model are way more durable. Side note, the bike will ship with 2.25 inch Rangers. Okay, this is a big one. We're changing out the RockShock Reba for the Ren Fork. And I know you're all thinking, what is the Ren? I've never heard of them. Well, Ren is an awesome little company out of Southern California, and they make great components. There are many reasons to like this fork, but for me, the best attribute is the tunability. It has two air chambers to fine tune your ride. It's also very durable and serviceable, and it has 110 millimeters of travel as opposed to the 100 millimeters on the Reba. I've been riding this sport for the past few months on much rougher terrain than the Divide, and it performs great. And the story about how this came to be is pretty cool. This past January on the Baja Divide, I met a crew of riders from Alaska. One of them was a friendly feller named Cameron who happens to work for Wren. He contacted me after I got back from the Divide and said that he'd like me to try out the Wren fork. I said we already have the Reba and it works fine. And he said, no dude, listen to me, this is way better. To make a long story short, he sent it, I tried it, Eddie tried it, and we love it. 
Since I'm relatively new to this fork, I invited Cameron to talk about why this fork is so awesome. Pretty much nobody knows about this fork. It's not one of the big names out there. I've been riding it for the past three months. I love it. There's some things that are a little bit different about it. And let's just, I would love for you to talk about it. Yeah, the first thing you'll notice is that the fork is inverted or upside down, or as we call it, right side up. So when you flip a fork upside down, you'll notice that like motorcycles do this all the time. Most motorcycles, you'll see the fork, the stanchion, the part that moves up and down through uh, the chassis is down low. Yeah. Well, um, there are just some inherent advantages to everyone who bikes when uh, you set up a fork this way. You take the internals and you put that weight up uh, on the top. And that means your lower weight is more minimal. So that's your unsprung weight. So what that means in reality, in layman's terms, is that the, the travel readily um, takes impacts more easily because it doesn't have all that weight to have to push through the system. So there's less weight for it to push through the system so it likes to, to engage more readily. So that that is really advantageous for people like us who are bike packers. You know, you know, this is going on the 600X, which is meant to be an adventure machine. You might go from, you know, single track to, to maybe um, a, a long section of gravel road. And your traditional fork might do everything you want it to do on the single track. But when you get to the gravel road, those smaller vibrations are just a little bit too small for it to pick up, for, it to, for a traditional fork to want to engage with. And because our fork is inverted, you're able to better refine it for a wider variety of little bumps. So especially if you're doing, you know, a 90 mile day on the Baja Divide, it's going to give you more comfortability through that spectrum of riding throughout the day. And what I really like is you can turn the dial and make it stiff and it's hard as a rock. You know, it's yeah, just like a regular fork. You'll see a lot of, um, you know, you'll notice between Fox and Rock Shocks and Cannondale and us and everybody, lockouts are not always created equal. Mm -hmm. um, and um, our lockout is rock solid. You can't move the fork. So if you, you know, if you're hitting pavement or whatnot, <clears throat> you know, you're going to feel it. Uh, which is also, you know, a really good boon uh, to bike packers. There's a number of really unique things about this fork. First of all, if you are a bit of a tinker uh, or you do your own um, uh, work at home, this fork is entirely tunable with just layman's tools. If you go to a bike shop or if you've tried to change your bottom bracket or something like that, you realize there's like a thousand different tools just to take a bottom bracket off. Uh, this fork can be disassembled with just basic sockets and wrenches, uh, nothing special, which becomes increasingly more important if you're in, you know, Baja, Mexico or South America, because or you're not going to find a <laughs> Yeah. So no matter where you are, you can find our, find uh, the tools you need to fix it. We have distribution centers around the world, so we can get you parts really quick in the instance you do need to fix something. This is a damper. So this sits in the non-air uh, side of the bike. And uh, what's uh, really interesting about our system is that there's no oil bath. So there's no like sitting reservoir of oil down in the fork leg. It's all inside this, which makes the servicing really easy. And it's one of the many steps we took to make our fork work all the way down to 30 below zero because we do fat by forks as well. Getting a- Wait, say that again. How, how cold? 30 below zero. 30 below, wow, okay. <laughs> So, you know, I've rode mine at 30 below zero. I live in Alaska. A lot of people, they don't need that. Probably very few of the 600X riders will be, be riding at 30 below. But, you know, forks do stop. They, they have the different tendencies once you get below freezing. And then once you get below zero, a lot of forks just don't really function as they should at all. Combining the inverted fork technology um, and taking into account the ease of, of serviceability anywhere around the world, uh, the final and, and probably one of the most important features of our fork for a, a bike packer is the twin air chambers that we have. Yeah. So we have a, a upper and lower chamber and a moving piston on the inside. Um, and that lower chamber allows you to adjust the travel stroke progression through the suspension. So on the 600X, there's 110 millimeters of travel. Yep. And you can adjust um how that travel behaves through its stroke 
So that allows you, um, by adjusting the area in the bottom of that port, uh, it allows you to say, I'm gonna let the initial stroke be very soft. And I'm gonna set the final stroke to be quite firm. Because when you're riding in, again, the Baja divide, like we were doing just last spring, you know as well as I do that, for the most part, you're hitting a lot of tiny, 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 tiny bumps. And then all of a sudden you're barreling down some giant mountain and you get to the bottom and all of a sudden you've got like small baby sized boulders and holes that are, you know, a foot and a half deep all over the place. So, um, you know, that's kind of your, your get out of jail free card. You've set your progression to be really aggressive at the very end. So you're saving that last little bit of travel for that, oh my God moment when you're coming into the, you know, the baby boulders and, and you just need that little bit of extra, extra travel in the reserves. Getting to know you better and getting to know Ren better, it seems that you really pride yourselves on helping your customers out. If anybody does have a problem, they can just contact you, not you specifically, but somebody on the team, and you'll work them through it, right? Yeah, I will Skype with anybody who owns a port or is even interested in getting a port, just like this. The thing that brought me uh, to work with, with Ren on these projects is because I'd never seen the owner of a company actively involving himself in every single client's you know world figuring out what they're doing and what helps them you know i you don't see that from fox you don't see that from rock shots it's not something in the industry we talk about as being a value that you're buying into uh and frankly i think it's one of the biggest values that you buy into it's an honor to be flying the ren flag on the front of the 600x you guys are awesome I love having bottles on my front forks and I wanted to make sure it worked out with this inverted setup. So I got out my hose clamps, clamped on some cages, put on my big cans, and there's plenty of clearance. And yes, it will come with the carbon bash guards and a shock pump. Now I know a lot of you love dynamo hubs, but this one didn't charge my items like I had hoped. So we're taking it out. I found that it was a lot more efficient to plug in my 2000 milliamp power bank every few days. This thing can charge my phone six times and only costs 50 bucks. This is the way to go. The bike will also be dropper post ready. It won't come with a dropper post, but if you want to add it on later, the internal routing is there. This is great for technical downhills when you need to get way back behind your seat to prevent flipping over your handlebars. That's no fun. Everybody hates that. This seat is awesome. It's the WTB Pure, but we're swapping it out for the WTB Volt. It's a very similar seat, but has a lower profile. And don't worry, it's just as comfortable as the Pure. I've been testing it out for the past two months and my butt is very happy. And this might be a first for a bikepacking bike. The 600X will have a beefy kickstand. I know that it sounds like a silly idea for a bike like this, but let me tell you why I like it. At the end of my days, I'm always searching for a tree to lean my bike up against to get out all my stuff. And sometimes there aren't any good trees. Well, this kickstand will allow you to prop it up anywhere. BAM! Kickstands are cool again! Alright, that's all the changes. We made an awesome bike even awesomer. Yeah, that's a word. The heart and soul of this bike is the pinion gate setup. This bike has the 12-speed gearbox. It's smooth, extremely low maintenance, and there are more gears than I ever needed. Each click on the dial is a 17% step. There's no overlap like a traditional drivetrain. You've heard me talk about how much I love Pinion in past videos, so this time I got Dirk from Pinion to talk about their product. What's up, Dirk? How you doing, my man? Hey, Ryan. How, <laughs> how are you? I'm so, doing great. Yes. Thank you so much for uh, joining me. I know it's 5 p.m. in Germany. It's time for a drink, and you're taking time to talk to my audience. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Yeah, my name is Dirk. I'm from Pinion. I'm a head of design and uh, marketing here in headquarter in Germany, nearby Stuttgart. 
Yeah, Pinion is a little small company, a quite small company. It's not that big like the, all the other players on the, on the market, but we are quite innovative. And this is since 2006 already, because in this year, the two founders of Pinion had the idea to yeah, launch, a, launch a completely new gearbox, but it took almost four years to be on the market. And um, actually it was early 2011 when the first Pinion Gearbox works in serial production. So that means it was quite a long time and I'm very happy to be with Pinion since then. Actually. Wow. Well, yeah. I've been using Pinion for a couple of years. I absolutely love it. My audience has heard me talk about Pinion all the time. So I thought it'd be interesting for you to tell us why it's so amazing. And I, the question I get a lot from my viewers is what is happening inside the gearbox? <laughs> How yes. many components yes. are in there? It's got to be yeah. pretty complicated. This is, this is really quite interesting. We, we always have this kind of question because it's a black box. Nobody can see inside and we actually uh, tell our customers don't open it because it's a sealed box. There's a little bit of oil inside and it has to be sealed and it will be sealed all the time if you don't open it. Yeah. And um, yes, inside the gearbox, there are more than 140 parts uh, working together very precisely, like on your automatic watch on your yeah. wrist, maybe. So um, this is really um, a masterpiece of engineering because it's a completely new and uh, patented design. The two engineers uh, designed uh, yeah, a couple of years ago. And um, yes, it, it, it took a long time to really make it uh, durable. And now, and since the beginning of our serial production, it's completely durable. That means all the engineering and all the uh, design inside is uh, based on automotive um, standards mm -hmm. and also our suppliers, because we don't manufacture the cocks and all the parts and the shafts inside the uh, gearbox. We don't produced by ourselves. They are produced by German automotive suppliers and it's first class quality. It's completely made in Germany? Yes, it's completely made in Germany. So our suppliers are really close by. We have a very good relationship with them and we really are focusing on uh, making the next step with them. We don't go to any other countries. In some parts are from, from Switzerland, yes, and, uh, but the most parts are from Germany. I've had mine for two years. Nothing ever goes wrong, and that's why I love it so much. But you still, you have a five-year warranty on this. If something does happen, people can send it in. Is that true? Of course, of course, yes. So what we did uh, three years ago, now we are almost eight years on the market, and um, what we did three years ago is that we are very convinced of our technology because we have five years um, experience in the market in 2015. And that means um, we were able to uh, send out the message that we guarantee the five-year warranty of the, of the gearbox because this is our experience period of time. And now we are almost 10 years on the market. And yeah, let's see what happened because we are pretty fine with the internals um, and the design of the internals because now we see the customers do more than 100,000 kilometers with one gearbox without any issue. Wow. I just had a phone call with another customer uh, a week ago and he is based in Frankfurt, uh, Germany as well, and he did 140,000 kilometers with one gearbox, and it's still the first one, and there's nothing to do, only an hour change each 10,000 kilometers. Do you think gearboxes are the future? Right now, you're the only one in the game. There's roll-off, which is a completely different design, but do you think more bikes are going to go this direction? Yes, of course, we, we are totally convinced of this. The roll-off company you mentioned is also a very good one. But actually, we are the only and first one who place it in the right place on the bike, yeah. really in the center, really low to make the bike with the best uh, balanced feeling uh, during riding. And this is where the power is uh, going to be inside the bike. This is placed between your legs. And this is the place um, we choose for our gearbox design. And this is quite unique. But actually, the, the gearbox 
um, technique itself, it's quite, it makes sense because you have a sealed uh, box. You, uh, you don't have to do anything during the year with your gearbox. The, the, you don't have to adjust the shifting of stuff. And this is what consumers and, and people like today. They don't want to go each 100 kilometer and adjust a little screw a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left have this all this trouble with dirt, dust, snow, ice, salt in the end. So this is actually not the thing people like to have a convenient product. And this is why we see also for e-bikes exampling that this technique will be the future. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I would like to know, how do you say pinion gearbox in German? Um, Zentralschaltung oder Zentralgetriebeschaltung. And this is something very German, of course. Zentralgetriebeschaltung, yeah. Yeah, I need to get better at German. I am very impressed, and I know you took your Friday evening to chat with me in a, a language pleasure. that's not your own, and I really appreciate it. <laughs> Ryan, always. As much as you want, as often as you want. I hope you are very pleased with your, with your bike, and you have fun a lot, and also for the next couple of years. Absolutely. Oh, for forever. I'm a Pinion fan for life, baby. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> and I can't invite the Pinion guy on without giving Gates their moment to shine. Here's Mark with everything you ever wanted to know about the carbon drive. One of the questions I get a lot is, what is this thing made out of? Why is it so strong in space age? <laughs> sure. Well, um, yeah, well, so we'll dig right into it. So it's a it's a polyurethane belt. Okay. Um, the body of the belt is made out of polyurethane, which um, is a super great uh, sort of material to make a belt out of because unlike rubber, it doesn't absorb water. It's not really affected as much by temperature. So it's super stable. So regardless where you're riding your bike, um, it's going to perform the same um, in a variety of conditions. Um, inside the belt, the main re the reason it's called carbon drive is because the the actual tensile member inside the belt, the, the, the piece that actually bears sort of the load and the tension and, uh, and everything while you're cycling is gonna be made out of carbon fiber. So there's a series of just continuous little strands inside there that uh, are molded into the belt. So makes for a pretty sturdy, pretty sturdy. Uh, right on. Really and what's really interesting about this is Gates as a company has been around for a long time. Really quickly, can you tell us what does Gates make besides these things? This is a teeny, teeny, teeny fraction of what Gates does. Yeah, so the, the bicycle components are, are less than 1% of Gates sort of total business. So, you know, we're primarily focused in industrial and, and automotive applications, both in uh, power transmission and then also fluid power. So hydraulics and cooling and stuff like that. Um, on the belt side, there's really two kinds of belts that we do. We do V-belts, which would be like your um, accessory drive belts for cars. Um, so think like your alternator belt, that sort of thing. Um, that's going to be a friction drive belt. So not really relevant to us on the bike side. And then um, sort of the more technically advanced belts are all going to be synchronous belts. So um, think of the belts on like a Harley Davidson or like a timing belt in your car or something like that. So yeah. the world that, that we work in with the bicycle products is really, you know, hundred percent synchronous and it's all really at sort of the high end of the materials and the designs that, that we work with at Gates. So what you're saying is this thing has a lot of years of R&D behind it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Gates started in 1911. Um, first belt products were really coming out around 1917. So, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're over 100 years now of doing belts. Um, the technology that's really in these belts really has its origins in kind of like the mid-80s is when they really got heavy into synchronous belts. And then it's just been, you know, refinements over time. Um, so yeah, I think that there's been a lot of, uh, a, a lot of super smart people um, having some thoughts about these belts for a long time. So uh, yeah, the final product has been, has been pretty great. Um, these have been in the market now for about 12 years for, for bikes. And I think they've definitely established a pretty solid reputation. Um, so we're happy with it. Very cool. Are you the only company in the world that makes these? So we're, uh, we're the only ones who really produce a belt that's specific with specifically for cycling. So you'll see there's other competitive belts out there. Um, typically they're going to use more of a, an off the shelf industrial belt. So you'll notice maybe the tooth size on those belts is either a little smaller, or a little bigger. And then the shape of the tooth is typically going to be different um, because it's actually designed for a different application completely. 
Um, those are typically for like an industrial thing where you have a drive that's spinning at a much higher RPM. So it's, it's a, a low torque sort of high RPM, high power application versus on a bicycle, it's completely different where you have extremely low RPM, extremely high torque. And so you need a completely different type of belt um, to really handle those types of loads. So um, we use a little bit bigger tooth um, than what you might find on an, an industrial belt of like similar power capacity. And then the, the tooth shape is actually different too. So um, we've done a lot to try to optimize the, the belt for bikes. And that's something our competitors really haven't to this point really haven't been able to, to do. So yeah, I'd say it's the only really uh, specifically for bikes. And you're from Colorado, which I love. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. quick question. I always tell people that these are three times stronger than a chain. That's just what I've heard. Yeah. What happens when it's the end of its life? Does it break or is it just kind of wear out? Sure. So um, the failure mode for a belt, uh, it's, it's actually interesting. So we're always talking about how belts don't stretch at all over their entire life, which is 100% true. The tensile cord inside the belt, the day that it's you know fresh off the assembly line to the day, you, you know, get rid of it, it's gonna be the same length. Um, so what happens over time is the teeth of the belt, the polyurethane teeth will actually, you know, begin to sort of wear away um, and degrade. And so if you see a belt, like at the very end of its life, it's just ready for, you know, yeah. to, be, uh, to be recycled or whatever, uh, the teeth will be, you know, cracked at the bases. A lot of it will be completely worn away, um, but the belt should never, you know, break. That's definitely not its, its design failure mode. So. Um, but yeah, longevity of it, uh, varies greatly based on where you're riding, you know, someone who's in like an urban environment riding in like fair weather conditions, you know, they'll get, you know, thousands of miles, ten, you know, we've had customers get tens of thousands of miles out of a drive, um, versus someone who's riding off road, you have a lot of sand and dirt and debris. Of course, all of that's going to, you know, wear away at all the, the materials on the belt and the sprockets much faster. And so that's going to lead to a, a, you know, quite a bit shorter life. So we typically don't try to give a mileage, you know, estimate because it, it varies highly based on where you are. Yeah. Um, what we can say is typically compared to a chain, you know, a chain's going to have the same problem, right? If you're in a demanding environment, it's not going to last as long. Um, so we can say typically for the same environment, a belt's going to last two to three times longer um, than a chain would in those, those same, in those same areas. Um, the flip side, of course, like day to day, there's no maintenance on, on the belt. So like, with a chain, it's like you're thinking, okay, I got to keep this thing in tip top shape. I got to keep it lubricated. I got to keep it adjusted um, versus the belt. You're just not having to have that, that thought. So yeah. it's a pretty easy system to get along with that lasts a long time and doesn't ask a lot of you um, throughout yeah. its life. You know, I've heard, so, I've read a lot, all the articles about this. And some people say that it's less efficient than a traditional drivetrain. I mean, sure. I've never noticed anything. I mean, if, if yeah. there is anything, I'm guessing it's teeny. What, what do you say? So it's crazy. I mean, for probably 10 years or more, um, this has been a conversation. Um, and there's been lots of independent studies that have different outcomes. People saying, you know, this is more efficient or less efficient. This is more efficient beyond a certain power. At the end of the day, the reoccurring theme in all of those tests is that the differences when they do exist are extremely small. We're talking fractions of a percent to the point that there's so many other variables in your bike to actually be able to discern, oh, this belt is less efficient than this chain in this circumstance. It's not really something that you or I would ever notice as we were riding. So, I mean, Gates has been, we've been pretty cautious about making claims because depending on how it's tested, the outcomes can be completely different. So we haven't really said, oh, this test is right. This test is wrong. We've basically just said, there's all this testing, people have opinions, but at the end of the day, people who actually ride these products know that there's not a discernible difference. So we're not really going to try to put an opinion out there. Can you make these in hot pink? Oh, we can. Uh, you need a minimum order of uh, probably a couple thousand, but yeah, I think there's been a pink one now that I think about it, but really, all right. I can find one, I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you, Ryan. Yeah. Well, maybe in the future, the 600 X can have like a jazzy color or something. Yeah. We can work something out. We've done the clear belt and we've done the red belt. I know we've had an orange belt before. So yeah, talk to nice. Dave. Let's make it happen. All right. I love it. I love it. Well, anyway, I know it's Friday and you have uh, things to do and huge parties to go to. Just oh, kidding. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I really appreciate you chatting with me and um, I will proudly be uh, using my belt drive on, on all my bikes now. So thank you all so right. much. Pinion and Gates, perfect combo just like 
Ernie and Bert. When I squeeze you, you make noise. Okay, I'm guessing that you might want to know how much this bike cost. Well, it's a darn good deal for everything that you get. The 600X is $3,500. Like I said at the beginning, we wanted to keep the price reasonable. And I know $3,500 is a lot for a bike, but you're getting a lot of bike for $3,500. And for the first batch of these bikes, the price is only $3,000. Now, if you're interested in getting this bike for this price, I suggest clicking off this video right now, going to the Priority website and ordering this bike. We've been pre-selling since July, and we're almost out. There will be more in the future, but you'll have to wait longer. And we all know that it's no fun to wait for a bike. This is a long video. And I hope that it answers most of your questions. If not, the guys at Priority are very responsive. I'm doing my best to answer everything here so that Dave doesn't get calls at midnight about how much this bike weighs. Wait, I haven't talked about that. The large is about 33 pounds, and that includes pedals, which are included. How often does that happen nowadays? You know what I'm most psyched about this whole process of creating this bike? is that we're essentially making it with friends. We know almost everybody involved in this, whether it's Dave, Eddie, Connor, Dirk, Mark, Cameron, me. There's been a lot of love put into this bike to make sure it is as cool as possible. I gotta take this moment to plug my own channel. If you're new here, I have adventure videos from all over this beautiful planet. And the goal is to inspire you to get out there so check them out and like and subscribe and do all that other youtube -y stuff. Now I want to end by giving a huge thanks to Dave and Eddie and the entire team at Priority for making this bike possible and for helping make a longtime dream of mine, Riding the Divide, a reality. Okay, have a good one everybody and we will see you down the road.